A recent news item suggested that Donald Trump would like anyone applying for a visa to visit the United States to have to surrender five years' worth of their um, social media activities. You know, everything they've done on Facebook and Twitter and things like that. Now, for many people, this is a rather upsetting thought that, um, uh, you know, that all that information should be in the hands of the government. Uh, but it's information they could probably find out themselves if they wanted. After it's all there, and I can look up people's um, Facebook profiles and so on and so forth. But it goes further than that, because there's the idea that um, there are special search methods and things which government has access to that could weed out information about the people. And that is a bit scary. Now, to some extent, I've addressed that in my um, a video called A Crisis in Democracy, I think it is, where I pointed out that the same fear was around 40 years ago in the 1970s. Um, and I addressed that to some extent in my book Thunder Squeak, how I responded to that and how to deal with that. But the issue has become a hotter topic recently because uh, Cambridge Analytica, a company that was known a few years ago for having helped, I think helped Donald Trump, but various other politicians um, to supposedly sway public opinion by analyzing uh, big data on voters' opinions and voters' habits in order to find out those opinions. And it came to the news again recently because apparently they'd ha got access to about 50 million um, Facebook accounts, which meant they had a huge amount of data available on members of the public. Now, if it was a question of just humans having to sift through all that, <laughs> you would say, I feel sorry for them. But the fact is that um, they do use a algorithms and artificial intelligence to explore that. And some of those are getting pretty subtle. I'm told that um, uh, face recognition technology can be used to determine people's sexual orientation, and it does it much better than humans do. And that is pretty amazing. And that would be scary if your sexual orientation is something that you really identify with. People like Cambridge Analytica um, describe behavioral change programs, and they are quite open about their um, ability to change voting patterns and um, to tell politicians how to manipulate the public. And that is a bit scary, because it's bad enough having um, commercial firms sort of analyzing our behavior and using subtle psychology to make us buy certain things. But when it comes to actually affecting votes and um, swaying public opinion, it all seems much more dangerous, much more manipulative. Now, going back 40 years to when I did the Abram Lynn operation, the operation doesn't describe what you must be doing every single moment of the day, except in very general terms, you know, being righteous and so on and so forth. and not doing naughty things and um, being uh, vegetarian, things like that. There's a lot of freedom as to how you spend those days. And I dedicated myself to, you might call it mindfulness, trying to be very much aware all the time of the fact that I was doing this six-month operation and constantly asking myself, why am I doing this? What do I want? Who am I? Now, this is fundamental to a lot of magical practices. You, know, you have a New Age workshop where you spend the whole weekend just asking that question, who am I, who am I? Um, and you work towards some sort of answer. And then on a more shamanic level, you know, there's the vision quest where you go out into nature on your own, basically with a question like that, who am I? Um, to search and look for signs in nature that will point you towards the answer. But I was doing it for six months. And one of the techniques 
I used or developed, um, I wrote up a year later when I wrote the book Thunder Squeak. And I described it in terms of peeling off labels, removing labels. You see, opposition society is defined by a whole lot of labels. At the time I was 32 years old, I was an educated Englishman, I was uh, 14 stone, um, I had brown hair, and, uh, and so on. You know, I could go on forever. <laughs> um, so, what this process consists of, I would say, okay, I'm 32. For many people, that would define something very important about me. But 10 years ago, I was 22. Now I'm 72. Um, have I totally changed into a different person? No, under that label, there's something, a certain me, which is still there, has been there all the time. The label 32 just doesn't seem so important anymore. I'm an Englishman. Now, for many people, they say, oh, you know, yes, Lionel Snow, he's an Englishman. They sort of really define me in that way. Um, but I've been in South Africa a resident for 10 years now. And if I applied to change my citizenship, would I suddenly cease to be me? Would I become someone else? The answer is it would make very little difference to me. Well, what if I'd been born in France? My parents had gone over to France and um, I'd become a French citizen. Well, that would have made more different, but I'm still pretty sure when I really explore and think about that, that I would still be very much the same deeply inside me. I got in a bit of a flap when um, with the, uh, you know, this vegetarianism and fasting, I was started losing weight. I was no longer 14 stone. It actually didn't make any difference. I was still the same person inside, just thinner. And my hair is now white and mostly gone. So you can look at all these labels and you start peeling them off. And for some people, it's surprising to find that what remains is actually bigger than any of the labels you've taken off. It's as though what's in the tin stays the same. And those are just labels. Now, I call the process, I think I called it removing labels. And while you're doing it, that's what you're actually doing. You're taking off those labels. But of course, the labels go back on. You know, I'm still English. I'm still 72 and so on. But the point is, you're no longer attached to those labels. In a sort of Buddhistic way, you're becoming detached uh, each time you explore those and realize that it isn't that important. Now, Society can be very rude about people doing this. This introspection, this navel-gazing, they have a lot of negative terms to it. Individualism, selfishness, um, narcissism. And the idea is, and it's understandable, that in doing this you're turning your back on your fellow people and you're becoming absorbed in yourself. What I found in practicing this is that peeling away all those labels, what was left, or what you were moving towards, was really a form of common humanity. What was left was actually what you had in common with everyone else. It was these labels that separate us. You see, society, and I, I use the term the religious culture, because it's, it's based on tribalism, people joining into groups which separate them from other people. Um, you know, to be a Christian um, means you're not an atheist or a non-Christian or whatever. Or being an atheist means you're not a Christian and so on and so forth. It's uh, being educated separates you from uneducated people. These labels are really the things that define what makes you different from other people. And if you become detached from these labels, you actually find more of what you have in common with other people. 
Now, being detached from these labels means you're less likely to be manipulated by them. You see, some people are completely identified with being English, you know, a nationalist, um, or being American. And so anything that might threaten that or take it away is actually very scary. And you will do anything to vote for the person who is going to preserve your nationality. For some people, it's motherhood as a defining thing. For other people, it might be being a man or being clever, educated. The more you attach these labels, the more you can be manipulated because people know what to say to flatter you or to um, reassure you. If you're not detached, attached to those labels, I mean, it is scary for some people the thought that um, face recognition technology might detect whether they're gay or not. But if you're not particularly attached to being gay, it's just a label which um, society's put on you to try to describe the way you feel. Is it such a big issue? A process like that, the magical process of looking inward, seeking the real self, in Crowleyan terms it's trying to find your true will, is a process of detaching from a lot of the labels that society puts on us. And society doesn't really like you doing that because it means that people, uh, society has less control over politicians and media are less able to predict and control you. I don't know if it's just me, but the advertisements that are thrown at me, I, I would be an ideal candidate for analyzing my buying patterns because I've been using online buying for ages. And even though I mostly prefer to buy in shops, I still explore and um, research online before I go to the shop and buy things. So there's a lot of information they've got there, but the adverts that come to me are rubbish. It's not that I've never clicked on an advert out of interest, but the hit rate is lamentable. You know, skeptics are very scornful about third-rate um, psychics, you know, using cold reading. But I think a third-rate psychic with a few months' experience of cold reading could look me up and down and say immediately much better what my buying habits were than any of these algorithms that have been tried out on me. I just don't find the adverts that convincing. So, if you're an individual, if you're a free agent, it just isn't so fearsome, this idea. They'll have to go a hell of a long way before they can actually manipulate me. If I ask to make vote on something or make a decision, and I come into myself rather than posing behind a label, the subtlety of that decision goes way beyond any of the labels which um, are supposed to define me. I'm a fully human person and I don't think that even Cambridge Analytica is going to be much good at manipulating me when I'm in that state. 